The 2022 World Cup in Qatar will probably be remembered as the most iconic World Cup of the generation due to the many thrilling stories which took place throughout the tournament. More importantly though, its relevance lies in the fact that not only Argentina but Messi won it in his last attempt at an international trophy as big as the World Cup. What I mentioned up until now is the majority of the viewers first thoughts on the Qatar World Cup. But for the people who truly believe in fairness and avoid biased opinions, they will know the true nature and motives behind this event. Today, I will be talking about the various arguments revolving around the legibility of Argentina's valiant triumphs and the possible behind the scenes rigging which may have just led to one of the biggest robberies in football history. The question of whether the Qatar World Cup was truly set up for Messi's Argentina is much deeper than questionable penalty calls and overall match officiating, even though, of course, such matters are really important as well. While we witnessed innovative technological advancements, rich footballing quality, as well as an overall welcoming atmosphere in the Arabian Gulf nation, we cannot forget the way the World Cup got there in the first place. In a country with less than 2 million people, with laws deemed as misogynistic, homophobic, and generally inhumane by the West, such attributes quickly put Qatar at a disadvantage in terms of hosting the World Cup. To overcome such challenges, Qatar put down almost $220 billion to fund the 2022 World Cup, which of course convinced the FIFA governmental body that they are a country fit to host a prestigious event. This video though is not about the eligibility of Qatar hosting the World Cup. So how does Qatar as a host affect Argentina in the tournament? Firstly, let us acknowledge the relationship between Messi and Qatari officials. Messi's transfer to PSG one year prior to the World Cup in Qatar cannot be a simple coincidence. PSG is one of the only teams in world football to not be owned by only one person or a whole group. Instead, it is owned by a whole country, Qatar. Naturally, the Argentine great has a good relationship with the Emir of Qatar as he is literally the face of the country's club. If Argentina wins the World Cup, that would not only benefit PSG but the French league as a whole. Not to mention the fact that this could lead to an extension of Messi's contract with PSG which did actually end up happening only 4 days after the final of the World Cup. Coincidence? People might say that the same can be said for other players such as Mbappe and Neymar. So why would the World Cup not go in their favor you may ask? That is where the media in itself comes into play. For Qatar to prove that it can host an event as huge as the World Cup after being heavily criticized by the Western media, something extraordinary has to occur. And what would break the internet more than Lionel Messi, one of the greatest to grace the game? holding the one trophy he does not have in his arsenal. When you look into all these points in a broader view, Argentina winning the World Cup benefits all the sides involved including FIFA, the media, and Qatar as a country. Laying this foundation is important as it shows that the World Cup organizers have every reason to be in favor of a team like Argentina to win the trophy. You will be proud of the Middle East and I promise you this. By the end of the tournament, Argentina had a total of 5 penalties out of only 7 games which is an insane number we have never seen before. The only teams which have gotten close to this number was done so all the way back in 1978 by Netherlands and 1966 Portugal, both teams having four penalties after finishing the World Cup journeys in their respective years. The bigger problem though is not the amount of penalties, but the way in which they were given. While watching these penalties, you will notice a pattern of questionable, game-changing calls and barely any hesitation to initiate them from the referees in charge. This penalty, which was the first Argentina penalty in the World Cup, was awarded against Saudi Arabia. As you can see, the Saudi player Al Malki was simply marking Paredes to defend from the corner kick, and Paredes dramatically fell on the floor and called for a penalty. There is just no way a player with Paredes stature can fall from that amount of contact. If the explanation wasn't convincing enough, in the game between England and Iran, which was played only a day before the Argentina-Saudi Arabia game in question, we can see the exact same type of foul against Harry Maguire. Here, Maguire is, in every meaning of the word, manhandled, inside the box, in a much more violent way than Paredes. And funny enough, the VAR was not even checked for England. And of course, the penalty was not given. This is just one of the many double standards, which I will mention later on in the video.
The second penalty given for Argentina was against Poland in the 35th minute during a 0-0 tie in which Argentina needed the win in order to qualify for the round of 16 to first Australia. Here we can see Chesney going straight for the ball which results in contact with Messi's head only after Messi hit the ball. So not only did Chesney do the only thing he could possibly do in a situation which was going for the ball instead of the player, he also did not obstruct Messi's attack on goal which would have been the only argument an opposing debater can make in favor of the penalty. Before moving on to the next game against the Netherlands, let us just appreciate the timing in which two of these penalties took place, a 0-0 tie in the first half, possibly the most game-changing period of a match. Jumping to the next game, we have the Argentina-Netherlands quarterfinals match in the Lucille Stadium. And here is where things get extremely, and I mean extremely, suspicious. The first weird call was a penalty on the edge of the box by Dumfries Stelko and Acuna. At first glance, even I and many other viewers were fooled by Acuna's shameful dive. If we watch that moment of contact back, you can see that Dumfries' feet were both in natural positions, and if anything, Acuna was the one who deserves a yellow card as he was intentionally looking for a penalty, which led to his dramatic fall. Again, you can see that Acuna was the one who quote-unquote obstructed into Dumfries' foot, not the other way around. After the non-existent penalty was taken by Messi, you will notice one of the Argentine players, Molina, enters the penalty box while Messi is running up to the ball, which is completely against FIFA regulations. Under the FIFA penalty rules, if the attacking team scores a penalty as well as infringes a penalty law, the penalty needs to be retaken. This rule was ignored for this penalty and again, you are left asking why. You would think technology such as the VAR would be able to fix these types of problems, but I guess a human is still behind it all in the end. A human errors may occur, whether that is in football or real life. So let's give the head ref as well as his colleagues the benefit of the doubt. Instead, let's look at even bigger atrocities which occurred throughout the remainder of this game. Here we can see the Messi handball, a very clear intentional handball. He surely gets a yellow card, right? He does not. Even though it is directly stated in the rules that a cynical or worse than a standard handball will result in a yellow card, such a rule was not enacted on Messi. Not only did Messi very clearly intentionally hit the ball with his hand, as we can see the ball would have been in play for the Netherlands team, which may have resulted in a goal scoring chance and this ticks off even more boxes for a yellow card towards Messi. Still not convinced. Only 10 minutes before Messi's handball, Romero's handball receives a yellow, even though one can easily argue that Romero's handball looks much less intentional than Messi's handball. To add on, as I mentioned before, Messi's handball obstructed what could have been a Netherlands goal scoring chance, while Romero's handball did not. So this begs the question, why did Messi not get booked? Here's the commentator and their laugh ball reaction to the situation. Dyke's asking that question. I smile because he knows why he wasn't booked because he's sleeping on Messi. Realistically, you would wish the favoritism would end for at least the rest of the game, but unfortunately, that was not the case, as it only grew stronger. While the aggressiveness was very high between both Netherlands and Argentina, as there was a total of 18 yellow cards in the game, one moment which stood out to me, as well as every other viewer watching the game, was the Perry Des tackle. Not one player in the world should be able to escape a red card after what Perry Des did. To violently, even maliciously, two foot Aki for no reason other than to hurt him, and then going on to shoot the ball at the Netherlands bench, and still be allowed to continue the game, cannot be a better example of the Argentina favoritism in the World Cup. A foul as disgusting as that should be a red card by itself, but then to go on and aggravate 10 plus players on the bench, that is just on a whole other level. There is no clear logical reasoning one can use to convince me that Perides did not deserve to get sent out in the 89th minute. Of course though, sending out Perides would be completely against the script given out prior to the game. The ongoing Argentina Messi narrative does not stop even after the full game is over. In a post-game interview with Messi, he overlooks the referee walking in front of him during the interview and spouts out rude, unprofessional remarks. If any player had done the same things as Messi in this instance, consequences would have followed. But of course, since it is the star boy of the tournament, that is not possible.
Another game, another questionable first half tiebreaker penalty. In the 31st minute of the Croatia vs Argentina semi-final match, we see William Alvarez making a run after a long pass, tripping the goalkeeper, but the ball comes just short of the goal and Livakovic causes a penalty. If you haven't noticed already, this is a very similar case to the Poland penalty Chesney gave away to Messi. So, Livakovic comes out of goal, puts his arms out in a natural saving position, not obstructing Alvarez's path, as well as having his feet planted in the floor, not attempting to trip Alvarez in the process. After this run by Livakovic, Alvarez runs straight into Livakovic, leading to a penalty? What? More of the story is, this can not only create inconsistencies as it already has, but also it can underpower the goalkeeper's role as a whole. Prior to analyzing the abundant amount of mistakes in the final between France and Argentina, we have to first establish a clear understanding of what we are about to get into. As all of you already know, France has already won the 2018 Russia World Cup, and one of the many factors tied into a competition's success is the variety of the winners it features throughout its different editions. I mean, there is a reason leagues like the German Bundesliga and League One feature much less views than the other top five leagues in the world football as they lack the competitive factor. In a tournament as huge as the World Cup, which only happens every four years, of course FIFA would not want the same team to win it twice in a row, right? The same logic allows us to compare the 2022 Qatar World Cup to the 1988 World Cup played in France as Brazil made it the final of the 98 tournament, one edition after winning it all in 94. Romario, undeniably one of Brazil's star players, was suddenly injured before the 98 World Cup. Brazil headed into the final as favorites, having an elite squad and winning the previous edition in 94. Even with such injury, Brazil made it through to the final because they were simply too good, just as France did with the absence of many key players like Kante, Pogba, Benzema, Kimpembe, and many more. Hours before the Brazil vs France final, Ronaldo mysteriously suffered from epilepsy, a condition which R9 has never had before. So you were unconscious? Was yeah, it? unconscious for three or four minutes. Do you know what? Do you know why you had this convulsion, this fit? No, no. and nobody knows. After missing two key players against a side as strong as the French team, which had the likes of Zidane, Desailly, Blanc, and other superstars, Brazil unsurprisingly lost the final 3-0 after a Zidane masterclass. Argentina, on the other hand do not have anywhere near a team as good as 1998 France, so they need an even bigger handicap. So how does FIFA make sure of that, you may ask? Hypothetically speaking, of course, would a flu spreading across the team not do just that? Well, it turns out that this scenario is not just theory or rumor. From the time the semi-final was played, up until the day of the final match, French players Veran and Konate, Kingsley Coman, Rabio, and Opamecano all fell ill to the mysterious virus going around. While I'm a firm believer that the players have gotten checked before the final for any flu symptoms, that still does not change the fact that they missed days of training. Playing at such a high level of football, being behind in only a couple of days of training can lead to fatal consequences. Since some of the mentioned players played in the final, would that not justify even a little of France's arguably worst performance of the whole tournament? Going into the final between two super nations of France and Argentina, you would expect the Messi World Cup script to be a bit better, but it turns out to be as repetitive as the earlier matches. The same exact sort of penalty being given again, a first half non-existent Di Maria penalty. Out of all the penalties which have been awarded to Argentina, this one has to be the most unfair and laughable one. Di Maria straight up trips himself and while falling, Dembele's foot skims Di Maria's thigh as Dembele was simply running behind him which led to a penalty in the final of the World Cup. Crazy, right? And the even crazier and stranger part is the fact that it was called so fast. No VAR, no hesitation, nothing. Straight up blew the whistle and pointed to the penalty box. This penalty in of itself would have convinced me there is some sort of favoritism behind this World Cup, but knowing the context in which this penalty took place allows me to completely confirm my presumptions about the overall event. After Mbappe's two goals to equalize Argentina's tally, France were desperately looking for a third to finish off the game. In the 90th minute, 
they had just the chance to do so. That is until Acuna cynically tackled Coleman on a breakaway. While this is a common usage of a tactical foul, the way the referee dealt with the situation was absolutely terrible. Giving Acuna a yellow card in the situation was the correct decision. But the way the play was stopped was very wrong and uncalled for. As you can see from the frame on the screen, both Mbappe and Colomani were on the breakaway, ready for a counterattack, and we all know just how fast the French team can be on the breakaways. The fact that the referee instantly called the foul instead of giving a 2-3 to three seconds window for an advantage was a very weird way to go about the situation, considering that Coman got up less than a second after being fouled, as well as this being the last chance in the World Cup final before injury time was over. Moving on to the other side of the coin, there were many speculations regarding the third penalty given for France as they believed that there was a handball before the Bappi shot which led to the penalty for France. While this may seem true on a first watch basis, looking at the footage from a closer angle you can clearly see that the ball hit Upamecano's head. The reason this is important to dispute is because many Argentina fans may attempt to use a piece of evidence to discredit the blatant favoritism throughout the tournament. It is truly sad how a career as great and influential as Messi's has to be glorified even further, even if that means tarnishing the sports spirit as a whole. Whether it's the money which comes with Messi winning the World Cup or the memories, one cannot deny the blatant favoritism which was present throughout this World Cup. Many congratulations to the Argentinian team as they of course had a really informed set of players, but to not acknowledge the rule bending when it comes to Argentina and Messi is the same as wearing a blindfold with the word bias written all over it. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. If you learned or enjoyed any part of it, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more football content just like this. Peace out.